Job chapter 1 and beginning with verse 13. Listen closely for this is the word of the Lord for you. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come to your word this morning together with humble hearts, we ask that you would send your spirit, that you would teach us from your word, but remind us of your presence in, your, in our lives. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Last year was a difficult year for a lot of people. You remember Hurricane Sandy hit last year and 125 people lost their lives and there's something like $62 billion worth of damage. In fact, there are still people today that are living without power and heat who have gone all winter without that in a cold climate and they have suffered a great deal. That was Hurricane Sandy. And who can forget Sandy Hook and the shooting at that elementary school? We, we can't possibly imagine the horror that those families have gone through last year. We can't even begin to imagine that. In the Philippines, there was a typhoon that maybe you have not heard about. It, it was called Bofa, and, and this typhoon killed an estimated 1,000 people. We can't even imagine natural disasters like that. They kill a 1,000 people. So do you know what the worst, in terms of the loss of life, what was the greatest natural disaster in our time? It was the tsunami. Remember that? It happened on December 26th in 2004, and the the biggest earthquake ever to be recorded on the globe created the tsunami that killed. They still don't know how many people died, but their estimates are somewhere near 275 thousand people. And do you remember the response that we had when the tsunami hit? Well, we started to ask questions and we started to think and, and a lot of people were going, what is, why would God let something like that happen? There was a woman named Heather McDonald and she wrote a piece in an online editorial and, and that basically the title of her piece was God has gone too far this time. God has gone too far. And he, he's created too much heartache and too much death. He's allowed this to happen, so what should we do? And her answer was this. We should boycott God. See, there's been all of these centuries of this uncritical worship, and, and maybe we just need to draw back and stop going to worship, and we'll play hard to get. And when God notices the empty seats and the empty pews after a while, maybe he'll get his act together. And then maybe he'll make nice, quote unquote, make nice with humanity again. So is that what you want to do when 
There is suffering in this world. Want to boycott God? When there's suffering in your life, do you want to boycott him? Or or maybe, maybe your faith somehow through it all actually grows deeper. How is it that you respond? When the storms of life overtake you and your life is taking on water, how do you respond? How does your faith respond? We are in this series talking about the whole subject of doubt. And one of the things that we want to talk about this morning is how doubt is influenced, influenced by suffering. See, I'm not absolutely convinced that that doubt is produced by suffering, but it sure reveals the problems that we have, things that will create doubt in us. If you've been here during the series, one of the things we've said is that doubt is neither a vice nor a virtue. Doubt is no, not a sin. It is a necessary part of growing in faith, but nor is it a virtue. It's not something we take pride in. It's something that we need to address. And I've been lightening doubt to the whole subject of pain, the idea of pain. See, when you have pain in your physical body, it's symptomatic. It's telling you that there is something wrong in your physical health, and you should address that pain. I think that doubt serves basically the same function in our spiritual life. Doubt is symptomatic that there is something wrong with our spiritual lives, some understanding of God, that there is something wrong somewhere. And like physical pain, we should address spiritual pain. And that's what we've been doing during this series, is asking some of the questions and, and raising some of the issues that create doubt in us. One of them certainly must be we need to talk about suffering. And if we're going to talk about suffering, there is no better place to go than the book of Job. If we read in the beginning, sort of to set the scene, Job loses all of his property, all of his animals. These marauding raiders come along and kill his servants and and take his his camels and all of his possessions. And then his, his sons and daughters are in a house. And the wind blows and the house collapses and his children die. That is some serious suffering. And how does he respond? Turn back with me, if you would, to Job in the first chapter. I want us to look at verses 20 and 21. 20 and 21. It goes like this. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, naked have I... I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What an amazing response. You almost want to grab the man by the shoulders and shake him and say, Don't you get it? You've lost everything. And how does he respond? He worships. He worships. In fact, it goes on to say that that he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is exactly what God wanted from Job, and it's not what Satan wanted from Job. Satan was looking for a different response, and because he doesn't get that, he makes a deal with God, and they up the ante, and the suffering gets worse and worse, and over the next 23 chapters in the book of Job, what you have is this conversation, an ongoing dialogue in, in, in Hebrew poetry, a dialogue between Job and his friends. And his friends are trying to help him understand what's going on. They're trying to provide a reality check. Don't you understand what's going on? And basically what they say is this. You are suffering because you deserve it. You are suffering because you are a sinner. And the punishment for your sin is the suffering. If you would turn, turn right in the book of Job and go to the 22nd chapter, I'll show you an example. 22nd chapter, and it'll be on the screen, but we're going to look at verses 4 and five. 
Job 22, in beginning with verse 4. Is it for your piety that he reproves you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great? There is no end to your iniquities. With friends like this, who needs enemies, huh? But they're, but they're basically citing an ancient idea, and the ancient idea is this. There's a cause and effect. The effect we see, it's punishment, and the cause must be your wick- wickedness. Your sin. It's a simple thing to understand. You did something, and now this is happening. That's an ancient idea. But it's not always right. It's not always right. In John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking along, and and they see a man born blind there. And the disciples say to Jesus, Who sinned? This man or his parents in order that he would be blind. And Jesus' response is this, neither. It's beside the point. This man is born blind so that the works of God might be revealed in him. It's beside the point. See, we want an explanation. We want somebody to fill in the answer. We want to ask the question why, and we need an answer. The church has always struggled with this. One of the things I'm not going to do with you this morning is is talk about philosophically how God can be good in the nature of so much evil and suffering in the world. There's a technical term for that. It's called theodicy. And it's a philosophical and, and theological argument. I don't want to go there with you. What I want us to talk about is how does our faith respond when we or we are in suffering, or we see other people that we care about in suffering. How do we respond to that? What does it do to our faith? Well, Job, as the story goes on and on, he continues to defend his innocence. And the scriptures point out, he did not sin, nor does he accuse God. But he has this debate going on, and and after a while, his friends start to get to him, and he starts thinking, yeah, God, you need to explain this to me. Why am I going through this? And as the suffering ramps up, he starts to get angry with God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you would, turn to uh, Job and the 30th chapter. Job chapter 30. By the time we get to Job chapter 29, he is in full demanding Response. He wants God to give him an explanation. He gets mad at God, especially he gets mad at God because God is silent. And then Job chapter 30, verses 20 and 21, we read these poignant words. Job says, I cry to you, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you merely look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You've remained silent. You've said nothing. You haven't explained. I need an explanation. We need an explanation, don't we? When we encounter that suffering, and we see great suffering in the world like hurricanes and and tsunamis, we want explanations. We want to understand. And what we do sometimes is we start doing like Job's friends. We start providing easy answers. Well, this is why this has happened. Here's the cause and effect. And we we fill in the blank because God is silent. Do you remember when Hurricane Katrina happened? Hurricane Katrina, and in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, they're trying to find explanations for all the suffering, and the Democrats blamed the Republicans, and the Republicans blamed the the Democrats, and and the Islamists, the militant Muslims, said this is the the judgment of God upon the nation of America. Louis Farrakhan said this is God's judgment for the Iraq war. There was an Orthodox Jew that said, this is God's judgment on America for letting the Jews, making the Jews leave some of the occupied territories. Everybody had a reason why this happened. Because God didn't say. He was silent. So what we do is we fill in the blanks. Here's the problem with that. When we use fill-in-the-blank answers, they never really satisfy our souls. 
they really never, ever, ever reach the depth of that suffering. See, I think that what we are looking for is we want some meaning to the suffering. Christianity and the Christian faith basically has two parts to it, two parts that it requires. One is that we believe in the existence of God, and the other is we believe in the character of God. And when there's suffering in the world, what we start to question, what we immediately jump to, is we start questioning the character of God. We're not able to understand, and we want to suffer with meaning. See, it goes like this. We jump to an assumption. We say this. If God loves me, he wouldn't allow suffering in my life. And because there is suffering in my life, that must mean that God does not love me. Or even worse, he doesn't exist. And because he doesn't exist, then why am I going through all of this? See how we fill in with the easy answers. And God says it's more complicated than that. When we are in that place of suffering, we, like Job, cry out. And we say to God, why? And most of the time, God is silent. Now, is God silent because he wants to punish us? Or is he silent because he understands our limitations? Maybe God is silent because he knows that we can't fathom the answers. This is basically what he tells Job. As you follow the plot along, you get to Job in the 38th chapter, and Job is, is now to this place where he demands an answer. I want to know why this is going on. I need meaning. See, we think that if we have meaning, then we can suffer, suffer with dignity and honor. You know, soldiers, if they know that they're fighting a good fight, if they're fighting for a good cause, well, then they can maybe suffer the loss of their friends and, and that kind of, even their own life with honor and dignity. We think that if, well, if there's some meaning to the suffering, if I get why, maybe that'll make it easier. I'm not sure it does. Because I think that when we suffer, we suffer, regardless of whether we understand or not. But we want to know why. Job wanted to know why. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this to happen? And then he gets really, really angry with Job. And then chapter 38, Job speaks, or God speaks to Job out of a whirlwind, out of a tornado, which is a great image, isn't it? Out of this whirlwind, God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I created all that is? When I created wisdom, where were you? The answer is, you weren't there. You were not part of this. You are the creature. You're not part of the creator. You can't begin to understand this. And skip down to a a couple of really poignant verses in 34 and 34 to 36. God says to Job, Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or giving understanding to the mind? Basically, what God is saying to Job is, You don't have the ability to understand why this is going on. My ways are so far removed from you that you can't begin to comprehend because you weren't there when the plan was set. I wasn't talking to you when I created the cosmos because you were part of the creation. So how dare you make me come down and give an accounting for what I do? This is essentially God's response to Job. There's a, one of the books that I've used during the series is, is a book by Philip, Philip Yancey, and it's called Reaching for the Invisible God. And he, he has a great way of phrasing God's response to Job. He says, No time-bound human living on a rebellious planet, blind to the realities of the unseen world, has the ability to comprehend such answers. 
God's, that is God's reply to Job in a nutshell. You don't have the ability to comprehend the answers. But what we want is those answers. And so what we try to do is we try to drag God down in order that he'll give an accounting for himself, that he'll explain himself. We treat him as if he's a teacher or a crazy uncle or somebody like that, and we say, God, you need to explain this one to me. I need to understand why you do this, as if our reasoning and our understanding will make all the difference. Sometimes it doesn't. Our ability to reason will only go so far, and then trust must take over. Now, not, what I'm not saying to you this morning is this, that faith and reason are contradictory and that faith is something other than reason our faith is entirely reasonable and we can think through difficult issues but sometimes God's ways are so far removed and while he reveals something of himself he doesn't reveal everything why it's not because he's punishing us it's because we don't have the ability to comprehend it at some point our knowledge fails us. Os Guinness, in the book that we've been using, he has a great phrase for this. He says, at some point we need to suspend judgment. Now that doesn't mean that we put our heads in a bucket and blow, blow our brains out and stop thinking. It's not what he's saying. When he says suspend judgment, he means that we don't immediately jump to conclusions. Like, I am suffering, and if God loves me, I wouldn't be suffering. He said, don't immediately jump to judgments. Suspend your judgment and allow God to be God. Allow God to be God. Guinness says that our prayer should go something like this. I do not understand you in this situation, but I understand why I trust you anyway. That's the way our prayer should go. I don't understand you in this situation. I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand why you're allowing this. But I do understand that I need to trust you in this situation. See, what God wants from us is a relationship. God wants to be in a relationship with us. God is not looking for you to understand his ways. What he wants is to be in a relationship, and knowledge will only take you so far. Trust needs to take you the rest of the way. Think about a marriage. You can know your spouse really well, but if you don't trust them, that relationship will only go so far. It's going to be limited. What God wants is an unlimited relationship that you trust him in all of these things. And that is hard to do when our natural inclination is to say, God, you need to explain yourself. And God's response is, I can't. You need to trust me in this. So how do you do that? How do you do that? I'm gonna leave you with a couple of thoughts this morning. First one is this, that the way we trust God is that we understand that God too has suffered for us. The God is not immune to suffering. We're doing this series during Lent, and during Lent we are reminded that it ends with Jesus going to a cross and then is raised from the dead. But the big theme during the season of Lent is that God came to this earth and suffered for us. Jesus came and died on a cross. Why? so that we might be in a relationship with God, that all of the obstacles, all of the sin that gets in the way can be removed. So you can trust God because he knows what suffering is like. He who was without sin took sin upon himself and became death for us so that we might be reconciled to God. That's why you can trust him. Another reason why you can trust him is this. God has never broken a promise to you. See, God has never broken a promise to you. He never promised you a suffering-free life. 
Suffering is part and endemic to the human condition. We are fallen creatures in a fallen world, and suffering is a regular feature of human life, even for Jesus. God never said, you will go through this life without any suffering. He never said that. But what he did promise is that I will be with you in it. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even in those difficult times, even in that suffering. See, I think we get the questions wrong. See, the question that we want to ask is, God, why? Wrong question. I don't think we need to be looking for answers. What I think we need to do is look for Jesus. Where are you in this? Show me yourself. Remind me that you are here. Remind me that you haven't abandoned me. Remind me that you know what the suffering is like and you're going to go through it with me. See, that's a relational idea, not a conceptual one. What God wants from us is a relationship. And at some point, knowledge fails us. Trust needs to then take over. When you get that bad report from the doctors and you want to know why, I would suggest a better thing is understanding is looking for where Jesus is in it. When you lose someone that you love dearly and all of the suffering and the mourning that comes with that, what you should be looking for is Jesus himself. Earl Palmer, one of the great Presbyterian preachers of our time, said, the answering to suffering is not a why, it's a who. That's what God wants from you. That when you are in the midst of that and you're struggling with it, he wants you to be looking for him because the answer is found in him. It's not found in your head. It's not found in your understanding. It's found in a relationship with God who created and laid the foundation of the world. What we should be looking for is not so much answers. What we should be looking for is Jesus. Let's do that together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, we do confess that we are when we are in the darkness and the shadows of this life we want explanations it is it is natural and human for our minds to try to explain and try to reason and rationalize why it is we're going through what we're going through but lord sometimes that doesn't help sometimes it in fact maybe it even gets in the way because we think that if you really love us You'll never let anything happen to us. But we do live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen creation, and suffering is an everyday thing. We pray that you would use that to deepen our faith, not to shake it. That instead of looking for answers, we would look for you, and that you would reveal yourself to us in a wholly new and wholly profound way. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered on our behalf. In his name we pray it. Amen.